We are in the midst of a summer series entitled A Church Glorious, and um, Pastor Ben began uh, the first part of a mini-series within that series, a uh, two-part series on uh, the family glorious, or a family glorious, and so we heard from him last week. Last week he started us off and reminded us that the church is a family. Right? He called us to be like any family, both multi-generational and inter generational, and today we will be continuing considering the church as a family from a little bit different angle, um, looking specifically at a ministry titled Life Groups. So if you're interested where we're headed, that's where we're going to end up, but first we're going to talk about some other things. Um, this past week, something, uh, something fun happened for me um, and for my wife, Linda. Uh, her family came into town, so I've had the privilege of spending the majority of this past week or large portions of it throughout, throughout when I wasn't here studying or doing other things uh, with her family. Her mother came into town and her three brothers and their spouses and then some of, the, some of the children, and so we've had just a great time spending time together. But as we spent time together, I kept looking for some great anecdotal stories or something I could use as a sermon illustration. You know, they kept looking at me, hoping I wasn't picking anything <laughs> negative to say. Um, but no, it really was neat. It was neat to see the, you know, this... this multi-generational aspect of family, you know, all the way from the twins who are three to Linda's mom who's just uh, had her 80th birthday not long ago, and so this, this multiple generations gathered together, all spending time together, playing together, swimming in the pool together, having a good time, and then uh, to see the, the inter, intergenerational aspect of it too, that we were all together, you know, there was not just a focus on, oh, what are the grandkids doing, and, and what is going to happen next for them, and do they have, you know, significant others yet and all these questions and things that we're looking ahead to the future, being uh, multi-generational but also being intergenerational. We were doing things together and, and it's neat because they're believers and so we have an, an added layer of, of friendship and fellowship together and able to pray together and spend time together. And we're going to be looking at that. It was neat for me to see Linda's brothers as they interacted to see that yes, they have their differences. Yes, they're not all the same and like any family, there's there's those things, you know, that uh, may be issues here and there, um, but to see their love that they had for one another despite those things and the things that unites them being family. And so it was neat to see that. They'll be here in the second service, so I'll say nice things are being recorded, so I can't say bad things during this service either. So it's kind of, I'll be present for the second one, but I told them to come to the second one because it's less populated and I'll feel like there's somebody to preach to here. So anyway. Um, We'll be talking about that this morning, the aspect, uh, talking more about that family aspect, the, the love, the interaction we have with one another. And it seems to me here in the West especially um, that this idea of, of the church being a part of our identity or the church being a family is something really easy for us to talk about. It's, it's easy for us to talk about. Um, you know, we hear a lot in our country, uh, you know, one of the American slogans is, you know, God, family, country. Or if you're from Texas, it's probably God, family, Texas. Um, you know, that sort of thing. Um, we talk a lot about family that way, right? The family is important in there. God's important in there. Um, and perhaps we think that the church as part of our identity is, is legitimate. Um, but a recent study on what Americans actually rank as central to their personal identity did not find that it goes in that order, God, family, country. Um, the order's a bit skewed. Um, but most Americans, of those polled anyway, said that family is the number one thing that creates their identity, in which they find their identity. And then second is being an American. Being an American, our citizenship here in the United States defines us and our identity. And then thirdly, but only 38% of those polled even put this down, but in the third category was their faith, their religious faith. And then it went on to the ethnic group they're part of, their career, their state, or their city, um, those things. But our identity is not, as quickly as we like to think, found in the church or in our faith in God. I know when we moved to Italy as a family in 2008, we didn't have anybody over there. We didn't speak the language. We didn't know who we were uh, going to be with. Our family was all back here. We didn't have any friends yet. But pretty quickly, the church became our identity I found it interesting when we were there, you know, when we, uh, here in America, it seems like when you get in groups, mixed groups, maybe a kid's birthday party or something, and you're with guys you don't know um, very well, 
the men kind of stand there awkwardly and not really sure what to say to one another, and pretty soon somebody says, well, what do you do for a living, right? That's kind of our default go-to question. What do you do for a living? That was like one of the last questions in Italy that was ever asked. The main question that they would ask was, where are you from? Partly because we were foreigners, but that was just, we saw that that was what they found their identity in, was where they were from, right? Because they moved around from different parts of Italy, perhaps, but most stayed where they were, and there was a deep sense of identity in being where you were from. Um, we move around a lot more, so some of us aren't quite as, you know, some of our Texan brothers and sisters might be more, you know, attached, but uh, some of us from Washington might be, ah, oh, we take it or leave it, you know, yeah. Anyway. But we found that, um, well, Jesus felt that, uh, that our faith had everything to do with identity. Jesus felt that our faith had everything to do with identity. We read this in Matthew chapter 12, verses 46 through 50. Um, yes, Jesus said a lot about family, and family is important as well. But he said this, he says this while he's speaking. While he was still speaking to the crowds, behold, his mother and his brothers were standing outside seeking to speak to him. Someone said to him, Behold, your mother and your brothers are standing outside seeking to speak to you. But Jesus answered the one who was telling him and said, Who is my mother and who are my brothers? And stretching out his hand toward his disciples, he said, Behold, my mother and my brothers. For whoever does the will of my Father who is in heaven, he is my brother and sister and mother. So who is our family Should our identity be found in family first, or should it be found in our faith? Should it be found in Christ? We often say that blood is thicker than water, but here Jesus is is basically saying the Spirit is thicker than blood. Jesus places the family of faith as the top relational priority, and our relational priority should start with other believers, with the church. That's where it should start, and then move out from there to our families and out to others. Of course, if we have Our family are also believers. We have that added blessing of being able to fellowship with them in that way. Another thing happened while we were in Italy. We were there to plant churches, so I began to read and study the Bible in Italian as I learned the language, even began to teach and preach in Italian, and I soon discovered something. I soon discovered that most of the New Testament passages that I liked to read uh, that were referring to me directly, or at least so I thought, were actually referring to we that large portions, surprisingly, of the New Testament were not just directed to me. It wasn't all about me. In fact, there are over 200 times in the New Testament where uh, we have a, a word, plural, a plural, what is it, a singular? No, not a singular. A second person, plural, that is translated simply as you. Simply as you. And so... That may lead us to believe that large portions and large commands in the, in the Bible are directed directly to us rather than to the church or to the community. I grew up reading the King James Version, as maybe some of you did. We don't use that here for a number of reasons we're not going to get into this morning. Um, but the King James Version, one thing I really appreciated about it, guess what? They made a distinction between second person singular and second person plural. You can see it up there. And this was the language back in the 15th, 16th century, right? That we had I, me, mine, and then thee, or thou, thee, thine, thy, thine, ye, you, your, yours. And a lot of us don't like reading the King James maybe because of all of these, these and thous and, and those things, but they were there for a reason. They helped us to understand exactly who was being spoken to. But sometime during the 17th and 18th centuries, we began to see a decline in the use of thee and thou. And by the end of the 18th century, the last one that had made kind of a last stand was ye, and even ye fell off. And uh, so we don't use those words anymore. And to some degree, it's a pity, because we don't have a way to distinguish a plural you, unless you're from the South, in which case you can say y'all. In in Ephesians, uh, the second person plural is is simply translated as you over 75 times. And we're using Ephesians as our primary text uh, for this sermon series. In in my studies this week, I found 
You're all familiar probably with version, right? The, there's a Bible app, and there's the, you can go online and look up version and read the Bible. There's also y'all version. So if you're interested, and that actually it's a plug-in somebody made, so it's a www.yallversion, all one word, .com. And you can go there, and they actually insert for you the plurals. And you can choose to say y'all or you all or youums or whatever. I don't know. There's a bunch of other options that you can choose. But our passage, our main passage that we've been reading from, uh, for our series is uh, Ephesians chapter 3, 14 uh, through, through 19, and then on this prayer that Paul prays. And here it is uh, from the all version in the NASB. It says, for this reason I bow my knees before the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth derives its name, that he would grant you all according to the riches of his glory to be strengthened with power through his spirit in the inner man, so that Christ may dwell in you all's hearts through faith, and that you all, being rooted and grounded in love, may be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and length and height and depth, and to know the love of Christ which surpasses knowledge, that you all may be filled up to all the fullness of God. And I believe that a passion for God's glory, a passion for the gospel and the gospel work among us and among the people of God, among those outside, will draw us together. It will unite us as a family. Because the reality is this, our first point, you have been saved into a family. You have been saved into a family. And if we back up before the prayer that we've been using as our key text and we just look briefly through the passages, we see, well, first of all, we can see in, uh, in, in the first verse that we read, it starts in chapter 4 with the word therefore. And we, we ask, what, what is that therefore? And, and this whole part that Paul talks about, walking in a manner worthy of the calling with which you've been called, is based on everything he's written before. And we see that Paul makes this pivot here in chapter 4, halfway through his letter. He's been talking about doctrine, he's been talking about practical, not practical, but uh, positional truth, rather. And now he's going to lay out the, the practical ways that we can, we can work this out amongst the body and how that looks. We see in chapter 1 that Paul begins this letter to the Ephesians by explaining all the blessings that they have through their redemption, how they have been adopted as sons. Look at some of the language there. They have been forgiven. They have been given an inheritance and are God's own possession. In chapter 2, He talks about how they were dead, but have been made alive in Christ and raised up and seated in heavenly places in Christ. He explains that they are no longer slaves or aliens, but are fellow citizens. They've been brought in. They're members of God's household or his family. Then in chapter 3, he continues to explain this mystery of how the Jews and Gentiles have been brought together into one body, into the church, to one family. As fellow heirs, they're members of the same body. They're partakers of the same promise in Christ Jesus. And then, of course, it culminates in this prayer that we just read and that we've been studying. We have been saved out of something. Yes, we have been saved out of something. But we have been saved into something as well. As individuals, we have been saved out of sin and darkness. With a future destiny of what? Of hell, right? Eternal separation from God. And for most of us in the West, we have this very individualistic notion that what we've been saved into is is simply a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. I don't want you to get me wrong. It's It's not less than that by any means, but it is something so much more. Before it was just me, right? Now it's me and Jesus. That's how we tend to think, right? Me and Jesus now. Jesus is just all right with me, right? Jesus is just all right. Oh, yeah. Or maybe your jam is more like, Jesus is a friend of mine. I don't know if anybody's heard that one. Jesus is my friend. Um, But here's the thing. Yes, you have been saved into a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. You've been saved in a personal relationship with the Father. But you've also been saved into something bigger than that, bigger than you, bigger than just you and Jesus. You've been saved into a family, the family of God. It's no longer just me, it's we, right? Before we may have lived as free radicals, free agents. We may have lived individually, sitting on the throne of our own lives, at least thinking that we were dictating what we were doing. 
Now we know that God is the one in control. And we have brothers and sisters in Christ. And we're part of a family. We are his sons and daughters. We are joint heirs with Christ. Tim Keller said it this way. He said, when God summons you into a relationship with himself, he also summons you into a new community of people who also know him. Like it or not, you are now a part of a family. And the Bible has a lot to say about how we interact with one another, how we conduct ourselves with one another. So that brings us to our next point, families. Blank one another. And I left that blank. It's a blank. You may have positive things to write in there. You may have negative things to write in there. Okay. But if we read on and read the first part again of Ephesians 4, 1 through 6, it says this, Therefore I, the prisoner of the Lord, implore you all, to walk worthy, or walk in a manner worthy of the calling with which you all have been called, with all humility and gentleness, with patience, showing tolerance for one another in love, being diligent to preserve the unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace. There is one body and one Spirit, just as you all were called in one hope of y'all's calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father, of all who is over all and through all and in all. We could probably just write the word love in that blank if we wanted to, um, since that is uh, said, it's said it several times in this passage. After all, Jesus told us that everyone would know that we are his disciples by what? By our love for one another. We're told at least 12 additional times that we are to love one another, but we're also told that there's a lot of other things we are to do. There are a number of one another commandments. And I'm going to read through the list, but there is in your bulletin a list that you can follow along with, you can take home. This has the references, if you don't believe me, but there are a number of times that we are commanded to do things, right? We are commanded to do things for one another. We're commanded to do these things for one another, we're commanded to love one another, to live in harmony with one another, to welcome one another, to admonish, to correct one another to care for one another, to serve one another, to bear one another's burdens, to be patient with one another, be kind to one another, forgive one another, sing praises with one another. Did you know that's a command? We're commanded to sing with each other, to each other. Regard one another as more important than yourself. Ouch. Speak the truth to one another. Encourage one another. Seek good for one another. Stir up one another to love and good deeds. Confess your sins to one another. Pray for one another. Be hospitable to one another. And be humble toward one another. And when we do these things, we make, we make much of Christ, don't we? If this church were marked by those things, this body were marked by those things, anyone coming in the doors visiting would be like, wow. We want to be a part of that community. What makes them different? What makes them special? When we do these things, we make much of Christ. We make much of the gospel. God is glorified in and through his church. We become a church more glorious, right? Which is what this series is all about. And the church is a family, yes, but families are made up of individuals, right? Individuals. You are called to be an active member of the family. There's an individual call, right? Can't be a family unless there are people in it. I spent this last week with a bunch of individuals with their own personalities, and we all enjoyed time together as a family. But you are called to be an active member of the family. If you are a believer in Christ, you have been saved into a family, and you are called to these things. If we continue on in our passage, verse 7, and then we'll move on, 11 and 13. 11 through 13 says, But to each one of us grace was given according to the measure of Christ's gift. 
And he gave some as apostles, and some as prophets, and some as evangelists, and some as pastors and teachers, for the equipping of the saints for the work of service to the building up of the body of Christ, until we all attain to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God, to a mature man, to the measure of the stature which belongs to the fullness of Christ. And been talking a little bit about that last week. Next week we're going to be talking about giftedness and, and giftings, how God has gifted each one of us. But brothers and sisters, we each have a part to play. That's what I want us to see here this morning. God has gifted each one of us with unique gifts. For what? For the building up of the body of Christ. God has given us talents that are to be used for his kingdom, for his glory. We each have a role to play, and we are responsible to actively engage as members of this family. Charles Haddon Spurgeon said this, Some Christians try to go to heaven alone in solitude, but believers are not compared to bears or lions or other animals that wander alone. Those who belong to Christ are sheep in this respect, that they love to get together. Sheep go in flocks, and so do God's people. That is the biblical model, is that we live our lives as a family. And if we continue on in this passage in Ephesians, just a couple more verses, in verse 14 through 16, Paul says this, he says, what the result of this looks like. So as a result, we are no longer to be children tossed here and there by waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by the trickery of men, by craftiness in deceitful scheming. But speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in all aspects of him who is the head, even Christ, from whom the whole body, being fitted and held together by that which every joint supplies, according to the proper working of each individual part, causes the body or the growth of the body for the building up of itself in love." This is what we desire to see, right? That's what we want. Is that as a a result of individuals giving of themselves, living in this way, serving one another, investing their lives in the family of God, that every part of the body works together and, and it is built up in love and we become a church glorious. You know, when we read these commandments, it was easy for us to see these things lived out in a small group in Italy of, of 20 or 30 people. But it's kind of hard, right? Hard to do all these things. I, at least for me, when I read that list of things, how am I going to do that on a Sunday morning? How are you going to do that on a Sunday morning? Can you do that on a Sunday morning? Can you effectively do all these one another things with every person that's here? It'd be great if you could. But as the church grows, we get bigger. And so here at Valley Bible Church, we have a mechanism for answering this question, how do we grow together as a family? How do we grow together as a family at Valley Bible Church? Life groups. Life groups. We have chosen life groups as our primary formal context for relational discipleship here at Valley Bible Church. Life groups are not simply Bible study groups. They're different than that. They're not simply home groups. They're not simply small groups, not simply support groups. They are all of those things to some degree, and yet they are meant to be so much more. But as I said, they are our primary formal context of relational discipleship at Valley Bible Church. What do we mean by primary? Well, primary is, means that, that life groups we, we feel are central to the ministry of our church. But we must have smaller groups so that we can live out what the Bible commands us to live out as Christians and thereby grow and grow together. And while discipleship, we know, happens throughout other church ministries, other Bible studies, other things like that, we have chosen to adopt life groups as our primary method. This is why we work hard to make sure that nothing interferes with that. Our desire is that every adult, especially well, every person, would come to a Sunday morning service. We've been encouraging you to consider also coming for either the first or second Sunday school hour, if you're able, so that your family is growing together to set aside that that is as being a, a two-church, two-service, rather, family in the sense that you're here to, to both learn in Sunday school, but also to learn as a family 
on Sunday morning. Grow together, worship together, hear from God's Word together. The second thing we desire after that, though, is that every adult would be involved in a life group. We want you to be involved in a life group because that is where all of these things that we've talked about can be worked out. These things that we're commanded to do that are important for our growth. So we desire that. It says it's our formal context. Um, We recognize that discipleship has to happen somewhere. Discipleship happens life on life. The, The restrictions on time and the attention that Sunday morning imposes makes it a poor choice, right? If you're coming here seeking to be this to be the place in which you are going to disciple someone or be discipled by them, or both, probably not going to happen. Because everybody's busy and you're here or there, about the most we get is, oh, how, how was your week? Oh, okay, good. And on to the next person, right? How was your week? Oh, great. You know? Half the time we don't even take the time to stop and pray with one another because there's not enough time. And so we need to be involved. And so we've created this as, a, as an opportunity for that to happen. Ideally, discipleship would happen naturally in our everyday life through life-on-life relationships. But without a catalyst for creating those, we know that busy lives make it hard for people to connect with one another. To be successful, our discipleship as a church needs to a setting where people can share life in a, in a formal context, not simply informal. And it is our conviction that an effective context for that is Intentionally gathering with 8 to 12 people once a week and sharing our lives together. Our desire is that this formal context would serve as a, as a catalyst, as an impetus for future building of relationships with other people as you get to know other people, members of your life group and others, and that that would lead to relational discipleship. So that leads to the next part. We talk about relational discipleship. What do we mean? Well, we are relational beings, aren't we? I know some of us prefer to be off alone for various reasons. Typically, when we want to be alone, it's because we desire not to have accountability, right? Or maybe there may be other reasons. Perhaps there's sin in our life, and we don't want anybody else to know about it, and we can put on a good facade here on Sunday mornings. Nobody has to know what we're really going through, right? What life's really like. Those may be a couple of reasons why we don't want to engage with other people, but By and large, we are relational beings. We're created in the image of a relational God. God exists in community, right? The Trinity. And Jesus taught his disciples while in the midst of what? Real, everyday life. Walking along the road. Eating meals together. And that is where discipleship, we believe, happens best. We see that as a New Testament example. Everyday life events and genuine relationships And this ought to work out naturally in a life group as people share their lives with one another and have the opportunity to bring the gospel to bear in the stuff of everyday life. So what are life groups? Well, life groups are made up of gatherings of 8 to 12 adults who meet weekly to grow together as a family by studying God's Word, investing in relationships, supporting one another, and seeking opportunities to reach out to those around them with the gospel. Our desire is that each group would live life together and, as they do, see the gospel brought to bear in the real stuff of everyday life. How do we do this? How do we grow together as a family? And we mentioned a number of things in there. And the first one is that we grow together as a family by studying God's Word. That's what life groups do. We are ser- have sermon-based groups, so it's different than some. We don't want everybody out there just studying their own thing. We want you studying the Bible. We want you studying your own thing. By all means, do that. But we also want, as a church, to be studying the same things so that we are growing up together. And so we have questions typically throughout the year on the back of the bulletin. It's not there now, so you don't have to look. Um, Do look, because it's a missionary prayer update. But don't look now, because there's no life group questions for this week. Um, Typically, we have those questions. And they're meant to help us to consider how... More that's in the text. There's no way we can plumb the depths of that text up here on a Sunday morning in in 45 minutes, let alone an hour or an hour and a half or however long we could possibly preach, right? And so we have this as an opportunity for us to read those questions, study those questions together as a group, and then come together to share those things with each other, share how God is teaching us through those questions, apply those things to everyday life. But they are sermon-based, and so we study God's Word together. 
Um, we grow together as a family by investing in relationships. It's an investment. There's sacrifice involved. We get our word fellowship. Fellowship from a Greek word, koinonia, which is often misunderstood. As Pastor Ben reminded us, if you were here in 2013, I wasn't, but I watched the message. Koinonia is often misunderstood. It's a Greek word that means coffee. No, it doesn't. It doesn't mean coffee. That's about the response he got to when he said that. It doesn't mean coffee. Okay. It's a Greek word that means participation, sharing. It has to do with sharing our lives together, having all things in common with one another. And so it's about investing in relationships, it's about fellowship, it's about sharing our lives, living life on life with each other, being real. Guess what? Everybody else in that group's got problems too. Okay? We want to follow Jesus together and push each other toward Christ and maturity in Christ by sharing our lives openly with one another. We grow together by supporting one another. And this happens in, in a number of areas. The first is through prayer. Life groups should be about prayer, praying for one another. We pray and we, we expect to see God work and then we hopefully share answers to prayer as well. But they're about encouragement, about encouraging one another. Encouraging each other in Christian walk, in parenting, in, in life circumstances, and what's happening. And we need that from one another. They're about serving one another. Perhaps somebody in, a, in your group has a need. Perhaps you have a need. And how is anybody in this, in this church going to know it, right? Unless you go and talk to an elder or you catch the right person on Sunday or you call here. But if you're sharing your life with somebody else, hopefully those people would know and they'd be able to support you or be able to tell somebody in the church so the church could help support you in that. So seeking to serve one another. We also grow together by seeking opportunities to reach out. We used to just say service, but sometimes when we think of service, we think just of serving in the body or just serving each other. But we want to serve our communities with gospel intentionality, right? If, if you meet in a certain area, we would encourage life groups to, to consider how in that geographical location or in a location where somebody works or somebody is involved in a sphere in, in the city to, to be involved. How can you be involved in, in serving our communities but for the purpose of reaching out reaching out with the gospel, because we want to see people come to know Christ, and it's important for our growth that we do that together. Last week, we talked about, about how the church is meant to be intergenerational, and, and Ben mentioned that it's a good opportunity, a good place for us to see that happening is in life groups, and I would consider, uh, well, actually, I would challenge you to consider uh, mixing it up. You know, oftentimes, I actually read an article this week that talked about how evangelicals, specifically, uh, are those that are least likely to have friends that are different or have different points of view than they have. Interesting. Why don't we want to gather with people that are different than we are? Um, so often we, we don't, but we all have a part to play in the body of Christ, right? And older saints, perhaps you are slowing down, but you have much to offer to those who are younger than you. As you heard last week, you are called to speak into their lives. Don't throw in the towel, okay? It's not a time to simply retire from what God has called you to. No, it's a time to invest. Invest in the younger generations with counsel and wisdom. They need it. Younger saints, you have much to learn perhaps, but... Also much to offer in perspective, in energy, in zeal, cultural context. So I would encourage you to engage, engage with those who are older than you. Ask for their uh, input. Invest. Singles, God has gifted you with being in a stage of life where you can invest in relationships. You can invest in serving others perhaps with more time on your hands and without having other relationships that are taking up your time. I would encourage you to invest. Marries without kids, God has brought you together to be a blessing. To be even more effective in what he has called you to do than you could have been alone. Don't squander that. Leverage your combined giftedness. Invest. Marries with kids, unless your kids are out of the house, I'm in this category, you are likely in a very busy stage of life. 
And you may be tired and feeling like you have nothing left to give at the end of the day. What are you going to do? You're not going to spend another night out. This may be hard to understand. doesn't make sense on paper, right? But I would encourage you that what you need is to be involved in a life group. You need brothers and sisters helping speak into your life, helping support you, helping you grow so that you can invest also in your family in a biblical way. And so I would encourage you to invest as well in life group. Growth, we currently have about 20 life groups. We have 260, just over 260 adults involved in life groups. Average of 13 members per life group. We'd love to see that grow because we have more than 260 adults in here on a Sunday. We do. Even during the summer, we have more than 260 adults in here on Sundays. And if each life group were to pare down to just eight people, just by, for example, let's just say we were all to start with eight people, we'd already have 30 groups then. Okay? We'd start more groups. And then more people could join because they wouldn't already be full. You know, that sweet spot they've said before people start not feeling like they're a part of it anymore is right around 12 to 14 people. And so if you get above that, of course, you don't want it too small because then it feels one-on-one. So they say 8 to 12 people is an ideal size of groups. But if we were to do that, that would each life group only started with 8. Guess what? You'd be able to invite two couples in the course of, uh, course of that quarter. And then we'd be up to far more people involved in life groups. There'd be room for everyone If you were to continue that out, then a year or two later, if you were to do that again and go back down to eight, you'd have 45 groups and there'd be a lot more people involved and then on and on and on. So I would encourage you, if you are a life group leader, to be thinking about growth. If you're in a life group, to be thinking about that. How do you jump in? I know we're getting short on time. But if you're visiting us today and this is not your home church, I would encourage you to get involved in your home church. See if they have a small group ministry. Plug in, be a part of the family of God there. And if, uh, if they don't have a small group ministry, ask them if you can start one. Ask them if you can start a life group. Engage this way. Show them what it looks like. If you aren't in a life group, but you do regularly attend Valley Bible Church, I would encourage you strongly to get involved. We're going to have sign up starting, not next week because it's family camp, but the week after that. Hoping that we'll have some groups that will have space in them, so we'll have room for you. We want to see you in a life group. We do go to whatever effort we can to try and get you involved in one. We realize that for some people it doesn't work out. But please make an effort to be involved in a life group. It is important for your growth and for our growth as well. If you are in a life group, I would engage or encourage you to to lean in, to engage, to invest, to seek opportunities to apply these things that we've talked about this morning on a deeper level. Share your life with those in your group. If you're in a life group, maybe you feel that God is leading you to, to maybe to start a new group. I didn't tell our life group leaders about this, so maybe they didn't share. Um, but I'm calling on you. If you think God might be calling you to start a new group, or maybe to host a group, you say, you know, I'm not ready to lead a group. I've been in one. We'd ask that you'd probably be in one for a while before you'd start one. But I'd like to hear from you if God might be leading you in that direction. I invite you, August 24th, 8 a.m., going to have a little life group leader training starting at 8 for, for those of you who might be interested. And then the rest of the life group leaders will join us at 9. But right here at the church, I know it's a Saturday, but consider coming. Consider coming. In closing, I just want to read a psalm, Psalm 133. We'll put it up. I, don't, I think I have it there, yes, on the screen. And then the worship team can, can come and uh, lead us in one last song. A song of ascents of David. Behold how good and how pleasant it is for brothers to dwell together in unity. It is like the precious oil upon the head, coming down upon the beard, even Aaron's beard, coming down upon the edge of his robes, and it is like the dew of Hermon coming down upon the mountains of Zion, for there the Lord commanded the blessing life forever. Would you pray with me really quickly?